I rebel inwardly against the role of father, spiritual guide. I don't want any of those. I want to be the conductor. And yet, what they need is 10% conductor and 90% um, love symbol. We forget. We deny. We are numb. Numbness is the process. It's a great blessing because we can't take all that pain at once. Numbness becomes the, um, it's like the transformer that steps down all that pain, all that grief, all that fear, all that hurt, all that anger. It steps it down and then we get it fed to us gradually, gradually, gradually over however long the period of time is, a year, two years. There is usually denial at first, until it sinks in, my God, it's true. Then I go through a lot of anger. Why did this have to happen? Why me? Then they bargain with God, usually. If you only do this and that, I'll give you something. It's a bartering. Nice, peaceful period, a temporary truth. Then I go through it very great depression. They mourn all the things they don't have anymore. Their losses, a hundred little deaths. And at the very end, if they are allowed to express their anger and their depression, they will reach a stage of acceptance. Swiss-born psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross has spent most of her lifetime studying the emotions surrounding death. Her work is known and respected worldwide. She continues to conduct grief workshops here at her farm in Virginia. We have to resolve a loss. We cannot uh, move on unless we have resolved some previous losses. And life is nothing but one loss after another. If a little child loses its security blanket, and then 25 years later loses their only child, if they had not gotten some preparation for it, they would commit suicide. They could not deal with it. But life prepares you. One day a winter storm kills all your trees. That is a blessing. You will not see it as a blessing, but it prepares you for something else to come. My mother died almost two years ago to today uh, after uh, being in a coma for seven weeks. And six months later, Jim died. Those kind of losses are overwhelming. And back to back there, I get dizzy just describing it right now. Uh, what allowed me to get through the loss of my mother was the love and support I had from Jim. Greg Cotton has lost dozens of friends to AIDS. He is HIV positive himself. His lover died just over a year ago. I looked over and he just took three small breaths. It was just... And he was gone. And I was thrilled for him and horrified for me. The hardest thing to do was leave that room, knowing that I wasn't going to get to be with that form. And, uh, you know, I walk softly through life, adding thickness each day is exactly what happens. It's slowly, slowly, you're able to come back to this world but then a thought or a feeling of, of that person you've lost breaks that. It's like it rips the scab away and you bleed again and you start all over. The reasons that my father won't, you know, will not tell anyone that it's AIDS, I, you know, have to be the classic ones. I mean, the obvious ones, the, he's ashamed of it. Um, he is, I, I, he feels shame for my sexuality, for the fact that I'm gay, and he's ashamed of this disease. Things have improved a lot since 1980, but the first 
few years were a nightmare until people finally discovered that this is not a homosexual disease. This is a human epidemic that affects everybody, poor and rich, black and white, men and women and children. And that helped a little bit, at least to take the big nightmare of the gay society. But they have suffered more losses than anybody. They have taught us a lot about compassion and love and understanding. They were fabulous teachers. But nobody wants to acknowledge that because they're gay. I got over the shame and the guilt of being gay long before this came on. I guess, you know, because I had felt so much of it at a time before I came out and before I, I really started breathing. I don't think, I, I think I had suffocated for 25 years. If you should shield the canyon from the windstorms, you would never see the beauty of their carvings. The AIDS patient, to me, is a Grand Canyon. They have so many carvings. You, do you know what I mean in symbolic language? And they are beautiful people, beautiful, because their soul is wide open. You can see it when you look at them. There are people that do care about you, and they will be there for you. I've also learned that there are other people out there who truly, truly hate. It hurts. And I cannot imagine how anyone, especially someone that claims to be speaking from a point of love, a point of religion, a point of, of God and Jesus and the Bible and all of that, could have these feelings that are nothing, nothing but hatred. They've got to have someone to hate, and they have chosen gays, and or people with AIDS to have that. Anger. Now there's a good one. It's okay to feel anger toward the person who left. And it's okay to feel anger toward social conventions or customs that may have contributed to your loss. And it's okay to be angry at God or the fates. But it's not okay to be angry at yourself. I love you. One of the hardest things, probably, was to call his parents and tell them. Um, to come back into the apartment. Um, even change the sheets on the bed to uh, hear his voice on the answering machine to uh, see his handwriting when Carolyn called and said Chris died this morning I immediately thought but today, and the way we got to know Chris was through his music. And I think last summer, when we first read through the song cycle in its entirety, and Chris was sitting there, I think it's the first time we knew him. And I'm not sure that it didn't embarrass him to have bared his soul so completely in front of us. Because as you know, with Chris's death today, we lost David Bassett last week. We have Randy in the hospital. And we have Miguel, who was put in a nursing home yesterday. And so you can't go through the process equally with all four of those people at one time, not to mention the other people that we know are ill. So you have to take a group in so many different stages and come to a consensus that for this moment, we are here and we are helping other people. We, we feel very isolated during loss. It's one of the processes of loss. We feel that no one has ever felt this badly before. No one really can understand this. 
and someone comes along from a sort of authoritarian position, like a parent to a teenager, and going, oh, you'll get over it. You'll find somebody else. And we're going, you don't understand. <laughs> you, don't, you don't get this. And so it's that sense that I'm never going to feel better again that leads people to the act of suicide or to numbing it over. I'm never, ever going to let this happen to me again. I will never be this vulnerable, ever. I know it's okay to be sad, but when does it go from being sad to being depressed? Carolyn began seeing a psychotherapist during Chris's illness. When Chris died, she continued to find therapy comforting and helpful in sorting out her feelings of grief. Because everybody seems to think, well, you know, it's been six weeks now, mm -hmm. so you should be back to normal. And those six weeks seem real short in yeah. some ways, in other ways it's like a lifetime. I think that uh, you are going to feel sad for a while. It's not realistic to think that it's going to go away in six weeks. Like in the last couple of days, there's been a lot of tears. Sadness is what most of us expect to feel during the grieving process. Depression, however, is another story. Many of us are uncomfortable with the feelings and behaviors that are brought up with depression, and it scares us. Depression is a normal part of the grieving process, and sometimes seeking professional help can be useful in letting us know that we're on track, and we're not going crazy, and, and that being depressed isn't part of grieving. When it comes to the point where you feel like you want to do harm to yourself or someone else, that might be a time when seeking professional help is more critical. If you have one human being, and it does not matter who it is, it doesn't have to be your mother or your father or anybody, just a human being who is compassionate, understanding, and knows what unconditional love is. If you have one such human being, then you can take anything, anything. For me, having him gone and the realization that he was gone was like a part of my insides being ripped out. Marilyn Hollingsworth lost her son Rick to AIDS six years ago. And I wouldn't be completely honest if I didn't tell you that there were some times I thought that it's not worth living. If I hadn't had um, my life partner and my main support, I probably wouldn't have done nearly as well as I did. Come on in. For Marilyn, getting involved and reaching out to others has helped bring some understanding to her loss. I got most of the materials. I got a lot of materials to work with. It's taken me six months to get these together. She created a quilt panel for her son shortly after his death and now spends countless hours Hi. running the Dallas chapter workshop for the Names Project AIDS Memorial Quilt. It was one of the most healing things that I have ever done, was making a panel for him. And that's how I got involved with the Names Project. I've been involved with them ever since. I'll sit and start tracing the letters for you. Okay. We had some quilt parties, mm -hmm. um, four quilt parties, where me and his friends got together and discussed doing the quilt, mm -hmm. talked about Lee, and stuff like that. That's part of the healing. Yeah, we had like 10 people at the first one. These quilt panels will eventually join 22,000 others at the Monumental AIDS Memorial Quilt Display in Washington, D.C. The grief process, in my mind, uh, is, is like water that you spill. The more you spread it around, the easier it becomes because it, the faster it dries. So I think that sharing it is a, is a good way to dissipate it. There are a lot of people out there that we could reach that don't have anybody to talk to like we all do. Marilyn still attends a parent support group she and her late husband, Dick Hollingsworth, started when their son was first diagnosed with AIDS. Many of you have been through what we're going through, and you reached out to complete strangers. But yet, when we came, we didn't feel as a stranger. We felt instant warmth and instant love. And uh, that's, the way and that's helped and us an awful lot. That, mean, that means so much. Um, your friends can support you, but if, as we all know, if you have not walked in someone's shoes, you really don't know what the, the feelings and, and uh, the emotions that you go through. Um, My neighbor 
who has been my friend, who was my friend for 23 years, mm -hmm. and her daughter and my son were like brother and sister. And there is no way that she could not have known that Chris was dying. Yeah. And it, she did not come to my house in a year. Yeah. Her daughter came, but not her. That's hurtful. It's very hurtful. It, and they, they don't realize you know, it's just like shutting a, a steel door, and and yeah. I deal with fear daily, oh, uh, in places such as my my job. I don't I don't feel like I'm free to share, but you know, I think when I weigh everything out that I've seen and experienced through all this, it's strange, but I don't know that I would change it. I don't think I could take for what I've learned about love and compassion, human understanding. People in this room tonight have shared the fact that they got, you know, love and compassion and understanding, but there are a lot of stories, you know, from people yes. who didn't. One of the members of this group was asked not to come back to her church because her son had AIDS, you know, and that was incomprehensible to me. And I would love to see the Christian community respond in a Christian manner yes. to this disease rather than only a few of them. Many parents who lose gay sons to AIDS struggle with accepting their son's sexual orientation as well as their deaths. We were scared and worried and every kind of emotion was going through us and we got to the hospital and the family that Duane had there uh, were a bunch of, of young men who happened to be gay um, and for the first time in my life, and I think Doug would agree, we saw these people as people just like us because we got to know them. Uh, if you ever wanted to know what love was about, you needed to be in that room with those men around our son to see what love was really like. And uh, they have taught me a lot about life. I was prejudiced against homosexuals, and I wasn't hostile, and I wasn't hateful, but I was prejudiced and I was uncomfortable. And uh, these people just surrounded us and took care of us. And uh, it, it was a very different experience. Been very different since then. You know, so many parents have said to me, well, what do you think I did wrong? Well, the answer to that is nothing. nothing. They did not have a choice. It is not a conscious choice. They did not choose to be gay. Those that have children that are gay, it doesn't matter how they got AIDS. When I first learned our son was gay, I had a little bit of shame, and it wasn't anything I would go around, you know, advertising. just advertising mm -hmm. or telling everybody about. But that didn't last very long, and again, the way he handled his illness uh, and his dying uh, and his life while he had the illness, I'm tremendously proud of him and, and mm -hmm. was throughout that time. The, the guilt... Uh, I wasn't a good father to him, and I'm guilty about that, particularly uh, the next to the last time he was in the hospital. I just kind of withdrew and closed up, and I, I'm guilty about that. I still regret that. But. but when it comes down to are you embarrassed about his being gay, mm -hmm. or are you dealing with the fact that he has AIDS? You know, I knew long before he got sick, but... Uh, being gay was totally irrelevant. Mm -hmm. The fact was that I'm dealing with the big picture, and mm -hmm. the big picture is that he exactly. is terribly sick. And uh, whatever I can do to make life easy for him, that's what I chose to do. He lived for 24 months, and um, he died at home. We made that choice, and I'm really happy that we did because I gave birth to him, and I wanted to be there with him. And I, had he been in a hospital, I would not have been able to do that. Mourning becomes a lifestyle. It becomes something that you're doing. It becomes the primary healing, surviving, recovering, becomes your focal point of the day. It becomes your number one job, and it can go on for quite some time. And as you start losing that job, there's a sense of loss over the mourning process. When you're in the midst of loss, you can only see this far because you're in too much pain. But if you are after or towards the end of the loss, when you begin to reach a stage of acceptance, you are awed 
about the inner strength of human beings. It's incredible how strong some beings can be. And the only way you can do that, if you have the courage and the guts or the chutzpah, whatever you call it, to look at it and face it. I think the irony of the entire AIDS epidemic, and particularly for me, is that what is evolving out of the most horrible pain in my life is a clearer sense of myself and a clearer, truly emotional stability and responsibility. That there is so much life that is brought out of this, certainly for me. I've learned I'm pretty damn strong, stronger than I ever thought I could be, because I've seen people who are less ill, is that the right word? Less ill than I would. And they just give up. They give up emotionally and they give up physically. Um, if you had asked me before this happened, I, I don't think I would have, I don't know if I could have responded, but um, my strength has surprised me.